Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's so great to see everybody here. Um, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to welcome you to the Williams campus. I'm Maud Mandel. I'm the president here. Uh, and it's really a pleasure to, uh, to have a couple of minutes to chat with you and also to answer some of your questions today. I'm joined by Gretchen Long, who's dean of the college here, and the Frederick Rudolph 42 class of 1965, professor of American culture. Uh, she's a, a professor in the history department, actually, as am I. Um, and, uh, and has recently stepped into the role of dean here. Um, and so we're we'll both going to spend a couple of minutes um, giving you some sort of overview from where we sit on life on this campus right now. Um, and probably I'll do the kind of a high level strategic visioning uh, piece of this and Gretchen will do more of the on the ground sort of life for your students. Um, and then we'll stop talking at you and spend uh, the rest of our time taking your questions uh, and hearing what's on your minds um, as you are uh, visiting the campus today. Um, I hope you're really enjoying the beautiful weather. We were very lucky um, this weekend, and, uh, and so you're seeing Williams as it always is, sunny and pleasant, um, and, uh, and we're, we're, thrilled to, we're thrilled that we were able to uh, be together in this um, environment. So um, I, I did want to um, start in a kind of empathetic space, which is to say that uh, actually both Gretchen and I have um, children in college. I have one that just graduated. Um, I have another that is uh, actually a first year student this year. How many of you are parents of first years? Can I see hands? Great. So, so you know, welcome to our lives. Actually, two weeks ago, I went to my daughter's campus, sat in an audience like this one and listened to the president give uh, a little bit of a speech um, saying the kinds of things that I'm going to be saying today. Uh, and so, you know, I really know what this experience is like, also having gone through it with my son um, a few years ago. I know you have a lot of questions in your, uh, on, on your mind, a curiosity, I hope, as well. Um, and we really do hope to be able to answer some of those uh, today as well. Um, I thought as uh, I started today that I would start with a story. Um, I'm a, I mentioned I'm a historian, and I like, I like narrative. Um, but uh, it's also, I think it's a perhaps just a really wonderful way into saying something kind of fundamental about the this campus. Um, so my story is going to focus on one junior, um, who I won't name, but it just for the purposes of not embarrassing that student, but actually you can find out, out more about this student on our website, so it's not really that private. Uh, but this is a junior from the class of 24. Um, who spent some time this uh, summer doing some research um, and prior, but um, cr and created a digital instrument called the Storm Orchestra. So this is a library of virtual instruments that are based on field recordings from Ireland's west coast. Uh, and the instrument, um, which is actually available online, so if you want to know, you can come up afterwards and I can tell you how to find it, allows users to play a coastal storm based on the sampled sounds of waves uh, that are crashing on the boulders uh, and the boulders moving. And people can actually also compose uh, with this tool their own pieces and supplement the sounds of nature with other instruments, um, such as an Irish frame drum, uh, uh, certain piping instruments, and others. Um, and um, the idea for this was inspired by a National Science Foundation grant, which uh, was supported during a research trip to Ireland uh, this past summer, which was led by one of our geoscience professors and four other students who spent several weeks uh, making the recordings and assisting with other field data collection um, to learn how boulder beaches respond to storms and change over time. So why have I focused on this one student and told you this story here today? Well, for starters, I should say I could have told you actually hundreds of stories like it, um, which is to say the story of a student research project in a collaborative environment working with a faculty member here. And I really wanted to highlight um, the, the way that operates at Williams because I think it says something fairly fundamental about the place. Um, but I also wanted to note a couple of other things about the story. The first is the interdisciplinary nature of the project, the way in which it crosses over uh, between science and the arts, music um, and geoscience, uh, the way it based, it was um, 
pulled together a collaborative project, students working together. The close relationship of guided research with a faculty person, research being one of the core liberal arts competencies that we hope that students get better at while they're here because really there's nothing they're gonna do after they leave here that doesn't have research as one of the things they need to be able to do. Um, so a guided research project with a faculty person working closely uh, with students. Um, glo the global reach of the project um, that takes students Students away from our lovely and today beautiful but sometimes um, fairly isolated campus uh, out in the world to do uh, the kind of work um, that I think is at the heart of this project. So I really think the story is uh, Williams at its best and I, I, I offer it, this is a, a junior, first year students are, are only beginning their journey here, but I hope you're, those of you who are first year parents and second year parents are beginning to see those kinds of um, experiences playing out. The sparking of intellectual curiosity, which I think runs so deep uh, in our student population. The mentorship coming from faculty, not all faculty, right? It takes a while to find, and we can talk more about this if you want in the question answer period, finding the people who are gonna be uh, the mentors and partners, and it's not just faculty here, but really, really talented and committed staff working throughout the institution who are, um, uh, really um, focused on student learning. Um, and, uh, and the way in which, um, so on the one hand, mentorship, on the other hand, intellectual curiosity, and I guess the third hand, uh, apparently I didn't take math in college, um, is, uh, is really um, that fostering that independent thought and independent ability to take a project or a question and begin to, to tease it out. And that can happen in lots of different ways. I, I'm actually teaching my own course this semester, which I try to do um, from time to time at Williams, and I'm teaching a senior research seminar. Uh, you know, this is a, also a class which is trying to promote students to do their own research. Um, it doesn't involve going abroad. It's not um, a multi-month uh, project, but it really is that same idea of what, is, what are you interested in? What are you curious about? What are the tools you need in order uh, to build your mind and explore the world? And so this is, uh, I really think, um, very much the heart of what we do here. Um, I, you know, I like to think that Williams offers students the very best generalist liberal arts education in the country, um, and that it's been doing that for decades by providing students with these um, cross-core competencies that uh, that we want all liberal science, liberal arts students to learn. Um, you can rat I rattle them off all the time. I, if you've heard me speak, you've heard me say them before: writing, research, problem solving, data analysis. The, and there are a few others, communication, right, that, um, that we see as essential uh, to ensuring that they are positioned for whatever they're going to do next and that we use the things that inspire them and make them curious to help them get better at those skills. So one of the things I always say about an undergraduate education is it actually doesn't matter what they study if they come to a place like Williams because every pathway here is gonna focus on those skills which then train them for the next thing they're gonna do. And also, importantly, for figuring out what they don't know um, and giving them the skills to continue to, uh, to learn those things after we leave. And I, I, I think we really do that well here in part because of the small scale uh, teaching uh, and learning that goes on here. Um, but we're also doing it in a context right now, um, and this is now I'm kind of shifting to my presidential uh, sort of strategic thinking as we go forward uh, into the future, um, which is, uh, you know, the world our students um, are graduating into, which is uh, technologically advanced, um, globally entangled ever more so with every passing year, and full of emergent needs um, that employers and um, communities uh, are going to be relying on going forward around questions of sustainability, um, social uh, equity concerns. Um, and as so we're also hoping that as they get better at those competencies here, they're becoming um, more focused in their learning on some of these uh, realities that are going to affect the world that they're going into now and to position them to be successful in that world. And that's really some of the um, broad themes that are built into William's strategic thinking for the next few years. If you're interested, there's a very long strategic plan on a website. Um, but I, I, I wanted to just highlight a couple of the things from the strategic plan that 
the strategic plan was a sort of a 10 to 15 year document. You probably are less interested in that because you're focused on the next four years. So I wanted to just pull out some of the things that are going on campus right now that will influence your, your students' lives while they're here, at, but that are um, focused on some of those strategic goals or pulled from those strategic goals uh, going forward. Um, so, uh, First, just speaking a little bit about a strength of Williams uh, in the science um, and math. We have a focus in the strategic plan on um, uh, technology in the liberal arts. So that is, what do you get if you come to a place like Williams that's going to prepare you for the technologically rich society that we're going into? This year, we have a data science course being offered in the computer science program. This is um, the beginning of, a, uh, we hope, ultimately, a building out of a data science program here. Um, but really, at the core of this uh, focus is um, continuing to offer students through science and technology studies and um, uh, applied math and computer science um, and uh, statistics, um, but also philosophy and history and economics, uh, a way to think ethically and um, intentionally about what it means to live in a data-rich world, in a world where um, uh, their AI is going to be really shaping their lives even much more um, strongly than it has shaped all of our lives. And so um, we continue to think about um, building up offerings in that area. We have a number of new faculty, for example, in our computer science department, um, our statistics department, et cetera, which speak to some of these interests. But I, I, I do want to emphasize that other piece of it, science and technology studies and the way in which which history and ethics and philosophy uh, are really built into our, our thinking in this area and will be going forward. Um, we also uh, continue at Williams um, to, I mentioned being the very best generalist liberal arts college in the country, and that's really um, means that in addition to thinking about some of the realities around technology, we continue to think about the breadth of the humanities and what that gives to students uh, who are going out into the world to make social change and live in the complex world that they live in. Um, and a lot of, we have very good humanities departments at Williams, and we are doing some target investment at targeted investment right now in the arts. Uh, Williams has a long tradition and history of uh, uh, focus on um, art history and the visual arts, um, but also in uh, all forms of the performing arts. And, um, and a lot of this work right now is focused on our College Art Museum, which I hope you'll get a chance to visit when you're here. Um, we're, we are in the process. We will ultimately be moving it to a new location and um, expanding it. Um, and, that's, and I just wanted to say a word about that. Most of that project will mostly be completed just as those of you at first year students are leaving. Um, but I just want to note, because it ties into other important things that are going on here at the college, that um, what a museum is for Williams, it is a museum, and that is the word that we use. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a legible word that people understand. But what a museum is for Williams is an educational space for the arts, the way the physical, um, the hopper, if you've been there, or the Wackenheim, our math and science buildings that have also been recently renovated, are spaces where students um, do learning in the sciences. So, and I don't know if any of your students have had the opportunity to do this yet, but there are courses across the curriculum not just art history or history courses, but science courses, uh, environmental studies courses, dance courses, that take students into the museum, work from the collection, and teach students how to see and think with art as sources um, of information in the way that, um, again, a science lab would get them to think experiential learning um, and hands-on testing uh, in laboratories. And that brings me to a, a substantial point I wanted to make, which is one of the things we really try to do here is build out experiential learning as a key component of student um, engagement. So that is evident in that first story I talked about through the hundreds of research opportunities that students engage with uh, often in summers here or with faculty uh, or in courses like mine that I described but also in lots of other kinds of um, roll up your sleeves sorts of um, courses that get students to bridge the thinking and doing gap. Um, and I just wanted to give a couple of examples. So, so in, um, and, I, and I'm gonna pull from the arts here because I was just talking about that. Last summer, Williams uh, introduced a uh, summer internship program for students interested in curatorial arts that allowed them to uh, work with institutions in the region through our museum, WICMA, but partnered them with 
um, for example, Mass Mocha uh, down the road. I hope some of you have had the chance to see that, or the Clark, which is an institution right here in town um, that uh, has an amazing collection of um, uh, of art that students can interact with, but also the Stockridge Muncie Mohegan Tribes uh, Historic Preservation Office so that's working on archaeology and um, object re repatriation here in town. So this this project puts students in as interns into these different um, uh, institutions and taught them through again hands-on work what it means um, to. Uh, be in, I guess you could call it the public humanities, that is showing people uh, through art and teaching people through art throughout the region here. Uh, so again, this is just one example of the kinds of experiential opportunities we continue to build out. It's really been part of William's program for years, um, experiential learning through our winter study program, for example. But what we've been increasingly trying to do is say that uh, if you come to Williams, it's a four-year experience. It's uh, eight semesters. But really what you do with your summers uh, matters. Um, and you're really constantly, while you're here, in a process of learning and growing. Some of you may have questions, so I'll just go right to this and we can come back to it about our Career Exploration Center, um, which is really itself very thickly involved with this sort of strategic thinking about thinking about Williams as a 12 month um, four, full four year experience and building out uh, internships um, and experiential learning opportunities uh, in the summer. Um, so for example, this past summer, we had, um, I believe, t uh, over 200 um, alumni-sponsored internships that students could participate in. These were uh, funded um, internship programs that students could, uh, so I, the, the arts program is one aspect of that, but there are many others um, that expose students to all kinds of work. These included things like sourcing and designing a clothing line in one case, um, and augmenting elementary school curriculum in another. Uh, and we really think here, if you, you think about the name of our center, the Career Exploration Center, we really think about um, the engagement with life after Williams as part of the exploration, not job hunting, although we do hope that when they graduate, we've helped them figure out what they want to do next. Um, but I think we think of it that way. It's what they want to do next. It's not necessarily what they want to do forever. And, um, and they do that through uh, exploring various options, much the way they explore while they're here. Do they want to study philosophy or history uh, or environmental science or physics? Um, and they figure that out by trying it and testing it out. Likewise, we hope that in their winter study courses and in their summer experiences, among other things, it won't be the only thing they do, but that one of the things they do is uh, explore what they're good at, uh, what's out there, and so many of them don't know, uh, by trying, um, experimenting, testing, and discovering and exploring. Um, and so this is also then a really big tenant of um, our current strategic work, is focusing on that 12-month arc and thinking about um, experiential learning as part of the undergraduate uh, liberal arts experience that's so important. Just two other areas I wanted to mention before I hand the microphone off to, uh, to Gretchen. Um, one of the other really major strategic goals of this college continues to focus on access and affordability and uh, creating a campus that is um, open to everyone who has um, gotten into Williams so that they feel uh, comfortable and included when they're on campus. Um, Williams did move to an all-grant financial aid program last year that, or this is the first year of it actually, um, and really uh, has tried to focus on removing um, certain burdens that were on families. Many of you may be in the situation uh, of being on financial aid in one form or another, um, and we have been trying very hard to uh, lean into uh, making the college as affordable as possible by removing the work-study obligations and the loan obligations that uh, families were facing. Um, this is our, our first year of doing this, but really want to stress that the goal here was to open up um, the possibility that students could take full advantage of the program here um, and not feel disproportionately burdened to be um, doing work back for the college uh, as part of their financial aid program. So that program's underway. Um, I just heard the other day that uh, when we announced the news, uh, a couple parties ha broke out on campus. So, so I'm hoping that this year uh, the uh, uh, the, the, the fruits of some of those um, new opportunities are playing out um, 
uh, as students take advantage of them. So I, I wanted to mention that. And then uh, one other area I just wanted to mention that if you're joining the Williams community, particularly for the first time, um, and take a look at the strategic plan, you'll see there is a significant emphasis on wellness and well-being. Um, and that's something that we're uh, uh, focusing on by certainly building out student support um, through our Center for Integrative Wellbeing and Mental Health Support on campus. Um, but really it is a broader strategic goal to, fill it, to, to figure out how over time we can help students uh, more build up the resilient capacity to take care of themselves are, while they're here on campus. Williams students, I know you know this because you, you raised them, <laughs> they work really hard. They, everything they do, they do um, with uh, tremendous passion and energy, um, and, and, um, and that's incredibly impressive. Uh, sometimes I would even describe it as awesome when you talk to them about some of the work they're doing and the things they're achieving. And as you know from my first story, I want to support them in doing that work. But we want to make sure that while they're doing it, they're, they're really learning the skills to take care of themselves uh, as well. And so we're con uh, we have um, folks from our athletics department, I know some of you were in here for a prior session around that, uh, working with folks from the Inter Center for Integrative Wellbeing and the Dean's Office um, to continue to think about how we can help our student community continue to learn those resilient skills so that, um, so that it, well, as they push themselves so hard to learn, uh, they will simultaneously be figuring out how to deal with some of the stresses that come with that. Um, and as for those of you who read the newspaper, you know that this generation um, has really been facing a kind of level of, of stress in that space that is distinctive, and we want to continue to think about how to support them well. So I'm going to pause there in my remarks and uh, hand the microphone um, to, to Gretchen to say a few things, um, and then we'll take your questions. Thanks, Maud. Hi, everyone. I'm Gretchen Long, um, professor of history, as Maud said, and dean of the college. And I thought I would um, bring us down a little, not down emotionally, but a little bit in the weeds of where your student um, might be, although hearing you talk makes me wish miss teaching. Um, I love teaching in the art museum, for example, but um, not doing that this, this semester. So. Where, what's happening now? What's happening day to day? Um, particularly for, well, for all students, but I'm, I'm thinking a lot about first year students who are really doing the Williams thing now. Uh, the honeymoon's over, they're stuck in it, they know where they're going, they know their professors, um, and maybe you're gonna leave here and say, why aren't you building one of those nature sound Irish science machines that I just heard about? I mean, where, where is that? You know, and, and, and when are you gonna create, go paint a masterpiece and, and please go to Mass Mocha and go for a run and um, climb Mount Greylock and let's, let's really wring every drop of, the, of experience we can out of this. Um, they're not going to build that sound machine uh, probably next week, I, I would say. Um, although, I think Maud's right. There is a connection between that five-page paper that's due on Monday and doing, maybe not that, because I don't know if that could be replicated, but doing something even more awesome or differently awesome. So where are we in the semester? They are in the middle of it. I mean, there are papers due, there are problem sets that went well, there are problem sets that did not go well, there's a lab report, there's someone you thought was your best friend and maybe they're not your best friend, there's a cute girl, there's a cute guy, you know, there's a million things happening and we're all there for them but we're, we're not, you know, it's not first days anymore, we're not constantly introducing them, saying this, here's this and here's that. So, it's an exciting time um, in the semester, I think, for both faculty and students because big, grand, strategic ideas um, and interesting concepts, now what they have to do is take those ideas or those skills that they're learning or that language that they're learning and turn it into work, often written work, the problem set, the paper, um, the class presentation, and that work gets graded. Um, all of your uh, children and students uh, did very well in high school. Uh, very, very well. 
they might be getting a grade that they hadn't expected uh, here. But I, I want to talk about that in, in just a minute. But it is, there's a lot going on. And I think it is, it can feel quite, kind of excited, um, exciting and busy and chaotic, but also really interesting and challenging. A lot of students right now are overwhelmed and uncertain, maybe a little bit strung out. Uh, with the work they have to do, and now their parents are visiting too. Um, but that, that's a good thing. That's a, and many students feel like that. Uh, that's one thing I want to say. Overwhelmed, strung out, that's really, really normal, okay, um, at this time in the semester. And it's a good time to remind them, and we should all remind each other, that there are so many people on campus who they can talk to if they are facing something that is hard. And the first people I would say that they should talk to are their faculty members. Faculty members here, we are so used to talking to students in our office hours, after class, in the middle of class. It's one reason we like teaching here. It's a reason people come here. And it's a huge reason that people stay here is because they like interacting with students like your children, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds who've never taken whatever the subject is before, like, that's our wheelhouse. We love that, okay? So if you can, um, encourage your students to go see your faculty, um, particularly if something's not going well. But that's not the only reason to go see faculty members. And that is a really simple thing to say to a student or child. Go see the faculty member. It's like four words, right? Just go, two words, go. They have office hours, that's what they're there for. But if you're not doing well, it's really, really hard. And it's really easy for a student to think, you know what, I will totally go see her, but I just can't do it until I turn in that paper that's late. Or, you know what, I need to get all caught up so I understand the question that I want to ask, and then I'll go see that person. Or, I missed two classes my 8.30 a.m. class, you know, I, I over, I'm too ashamed of myself. In fact, I probably just won't even go back. No, 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 like this is the moment. This is the moment to go. All those things, don't wait till you've written the paper that's late. Don't wait till you somehow teach yourself the, the, the calculus formula. I also didn't take math in, in college, <laughs> you know. Exactly, we're both, I should have gone to see that professor. So, um, <laughs> Go, you know, we can meet them where they are, and we are teachers. And a lot of our teaching does happen in office hours, one-on-one, -on -one, or one-on-two, or in tutorials, and that kind of thing. So I would just say that is, um, that is a go see your professor, right? You can say that, and then you can quote all the things that I just, um, just said. But please don't avoid the faculty. Um, they don't like it. Students don't like it, and it's, it's not the reason they came to a place like, like here. Um, I also, I alluded a little bit to things maybe that didn't go so well. Um, maybe they got back a paper with a lot of writing um, in the margins from Maude Mandel. Maybe they got um, a problem set where they got lots of problems wrong. Um, and that's also really normal in the first six weeks. This is a step up for students. Um, and I will also say, we wanna take care of that. We wanna to talk to the faculty member, understand how to do better, but it's not really a predictor of how they're going to do at Williams or what major they should have, or maybe even how they're gonna do in that class. There are very, very, very few classes and certainly probably none for first and second years, students that rise and fall on one assignment or two assignments. Um, so it's, a, it's not a good predictor. It's not, it's not anything that's showing you the path that, that you'll be on or won't be on. Um, it is an opportunity, though, to do something that a lot of your students haven't had to do before, which is to go and say, um, help, I'm lost, I don't get it, I didn't, know. I didn't understand, I still don't understand. 
and work through that. And we all know that even beyond college, being able to ask for help in the world is a good thing and one that very, very successful people um, do and are, are good at. Um, I also want to say, um, apart from faculty, there are lots of academic resources that your students heard about in a kind of tidal wave of information in first days. But now is another good moment to remind them. We have a writing center. They can have a peer tutor for writing. We have a math resources center for quantitative work. Those are both on the um, fourth floor of the library. Uh, and you can ask your student to walk you up there and point out, um, point out the rooms. There's a special tutoring program for students taking economics, which is a very popular um, class, those sort of intro level microeconomics. So all of those maybe just sounded like things they heard in first days. Now is the moment to, to take advantage of them. Um, and so we all want to reconnect our students now with those resources. And in fact, when we talk to seniors, um, a lot of them say, I wish I had gone to get extra help earlier in my, in my career here. That they, the writing skills that they learned um, early on from our writing tutors carried them um, through a lot of classes. So go ahead and use them. That's what they're, that's what they're there for. I mean, who else would they be there for, right? Um, I want to talk now a little bit about next semester because actually starting on Monday, your students are going to be registering um, for their classes for next semester. And you might want to have some conversations with them about what they want to do. Um, and if there's things they know they have to do, you know, we do have distribution requirements. It's nice to think about knocking those some of those out um, in the first year. They're writing skills classes, um, taking classes in three of our uh, different divisions. A lot of students might not know what they want to major in. The thing they thought they wanted to do, they, it, it's just not, they're not feeling it, or they didn't get into the intro, whatever the, the class is. Um, try again to get into it. You can still explore. I, a lot of students don't start their major until sophomore year. Um, you know, there's time to take something that just sounds interesting or that you now have the confidence to take. Take a tutorial. Um, take a music class. There's a million things. And it's totally OK not to know what your major is or to know what your somehow big plan is. Who are you going to be second semester senior year? You know, there isn't, if they have a crystal ball, they know. Otherwise, they don't. Um, and we certainly don't know. But, you know, we're, we're all going to work with them uh, to, to get there. Um, there are some questions that I like to ask my students, my first semester, uh, first year students, when I'm advising about the second semester, as I've been doing um, a lot of this week which is to sort of ask them about classes not in terms of subject, but more the kinds of skills that they get. Like, would they like to do something experiential? You know, whether that is like a lab science where they're getting in there and doing something or a studio art class. How would they feel about um, a foreign language class um, where they're actually learning a new skill and having like silly little conversations. My, my, I have a son in college, and he's taking Spanish one, um, and like having these little mock conversations all the time, which are, it's a really great break from the kind of mind-crushing math that he's also, also taking. And Spanish is actually much, much harder, I think, for him um, than, the, than the math. Uh, what skills do they want to build? Do they want to take a tutorial where they really have to say what they think? and think on their feet and respond to someone else's ideas in a, in a tiny little class like that? Do they want to take a seminar um, where there is no back of the classroom? And that's a lot of our classes, I will say. Um, but do they want to sort of put themselves on the spot? Um, do they want to take a creative writing class where they're going to be writing a lot and sort of improve their fluency? Um, there's a lot of ways to 
think about classes outside of subject area and department. And I would encourage you to sort of ask them to think in that, in that way. Um, the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is uh, friendships and relationships at this point in the semester. Um, at the beginning of the year, students spend, or first year students spend, a lot of time with their entries. Those are the people they live with, those are the people it's really easy to walk to breakfast or lunch with or class. Now I hope that they're exploring outside of their sort of residential units a little bit. And it's really normal not to sort of have found your group or your best friend or your, the, the person you think you're going to spend the whole four years with and you're going to go through everything together and you're going to be friends, you know, for the rest of your lives and that's why you come to a place like Williams. We're only six weeks in and just like in the world when we, you know, when, we're ki when we have kids, the friendships often arise because, you know, they're in the same class together from nine till three, or they live in the same neighborhood, or they meet each other at church or synagogue or what have you, um, or they're on an athletic team together. At college, it's a little bit different. Um, no, they're, they're exposed to people who, wonderful, wonderful diversity, people who are very different than themselves, whose backgrounds in all kinds of ways do not sort of overlay with theirs. And they may feel like they don't have a sort of common um, vocabulary or experience that they both can latch onto. It takes a little more work. And we all know that from just kind of living in the world, moving to a new place. It takes a little more work to find who's gonna be your people. But I would just say it's early days and they will find their people um, and they, they probably already have an inkling of it, but it is completely normal not to be sort of sunk into some best friend forever um, group at this at this time. Um, I will say um, that when they build those relationships, they will be friends. I'm always amazed at how much these Williams students stay in touch with each other long after graduation and sometimes even send me little selfies they took when they met each other halfway around the world or, or what have you. Like two, I have uh, a pair who were in my tutorial a couple years ago. They both graduated and they love sending me pictures of, oh, we got together in San Francisco or we saw each other in Alabama or whatever. Um, and they, they got to be friends in my tutorial. So that is, is, a, nice, is a nice little thing for me. Um, I think that's all I have to say. I'm so glad you're here. It's a really nice lift for your students to see you at this point, even if you know they might be shy about saying it. It's just really wonderful that you're here and they can show you around with a lot more confidence. So um, treat them right, have some fun. Um, thank you for bringing the sunshine. Um, enjoy the foliage and we can have some questions now and hopefully say some reassuring things. Okay, so we're gonna open it up for questions. I'll just share that uh, when we went to visit our daughter uh, for family weekend, there was a certain point of it where she was too busy to see us. And that's also quite normal. So if you're experiencing that, um, understand that a family weekend is also for you. Um, and, uh, and they might very well uh, be busy writing papers or on the field, athletic field, or, or rehearsing for some great show that they're gonna, they're gonna launch. And that's, that's also a sign that, uh, that things are going as they're supposed to, even if it doesn't feel quite like what you were expecting. So, all right, we're gonna open things up for questions. Uh, yes, I see one right here. So thanks so much for laying out the different things for the curriculum. It's really intuitive to understand how the semesters work. And this is actually my third child who's a first year, so it's not my first rodeo. This whole January term um, is, I, I think for them to like wrap their head around to see what they're access to, what they're able to. And I actually, it's a little bit more complicated for my student because she has a winter sport and there's a lot of um, athletic responsibilities like on Fridays and they're gone for some other days. And so it's sort of like, how do they, how do they wrap their head around it? And I was trying to encourage her to take something fun like ceramics or do something experiential. But I think that they're all trying to figure out like how you get into the right course and like what there's space for and like how do you, 
um, think creatively. And I, I know that they are talking about it, but I just didn't know from a parent perspective if there were ways we could advise them. That way it would be a little bit more. Um, I'll take a stab and then you want to jump in too. I mean, first of all, I would just say, first, I would say this actually about any class at Williams, but really about winter study, you know, th they should do what they want to do. Like, there's really nothing heavy about <laughs> winter study, right? In fact, half the point of it um, is really to understand that you can be learning something and engaged in something um, and enjoying it and take off all that stress and pressure. Um, so one of the things is that. It is true that um, some of the popular classes fill up very quickly, um, and sometimes students will get into their third or fourth choice, but I have heard over and over, and this is really where you can be helpful. Like, I got stuck in, you know, fill in the blank, something, you know, and I say this as, this is about a course that I know is very popular, but quilt making, I'll just, using that as an example right now, right? I got stuck in a, I didn't want, and then it turned out to be my favorite experience, or I did this amazing thing. That just happens a lot, and it's this very low stakes decision. So really, I think it would be just encourage them to, to have some fun, um, but maybe a little like, you know, the whole college application, like don't process, don't get wedded to your first choice, right? Think about, think it's okay, there's so many things to think about and do, and really to just make it, a, especially in the first year, but really all four years, is a very low stakes decision. Yeah, I would just say in terms of schedule, she might wanna speak both with her coach and the instructor and just figure out, I'm sure it's a, I'm sure something can be can be discovered and if yeah if there's a conflict it's good to just don't take quilt making yeah. you know <laughs> yeah but most of the winter studies understand i mean a lot we have a lot of winter athletes here and yeah. they do understand that that's happening i should say a large number of the people who teach in winter study are alumni um, and they really understand some of these pressures so there's faculty but there's also all kinds of uh, williams alum who teach in this program and you know are so excited to do it and will work with students in all kinds of um, complex situations so thank you uh, there's a hand back there Sure. Okay, I'll repeat the question. I should have done that before. So the question is about the state of the endowment uh, in light of uh, the market. <laughs> yeah, I got nothing to say about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Never think about it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, uh, Williams had a very good year, as did many, many um, higher ed endowments. Um, two years ago, uh, where our um, returns were uh, just under 50%. This is really quite an incredible um, and historically, uh, not unprecedented actually, but notable, um, and not even the highest actually historically, but n uh, certainly a notable year. Um, historically, what we know is that uh, after a big year like that, there's usually two years of decline. We'll see if this follows, uh, but so far so good. So in year one, there has been a decline uh, of 11%. Um, which uh, actually, you know, in a very simple math equation, still is good news, right? Um, uh, it's a little more complicated, and this is actually the more interesting part of the story right now, because uh, the, that historic first of what is likely a two-year decline uh, is coupled with very high inflationary pressures. You know this, you're all experiencing it in your lines of work, but that's what's distinct uh, from, say, 2008, 2009, where there were big swings or the prior uh, collapse at that point. So, so the real impact of the decline is greater than um, would have been true if it was, quote, just 11%, right? Um, so th that's the sort of simplest math answer to, I, I learned that much math since college <laughs> to, to explain. Um, uh, and it does have an impact, uh, for sure, um, on, on the college. On the other hand, Williams is a very well-resourced institution. Um, and, uh, you know, we, um, I think, are not, we don't struggle with the kinds of things other institutions struggle with in a moment like this. Having said that, the way we approach our budget whether it's 49% up or 11% down is always the same. We don't think about it in one year increments, and that's really important. So after that 49%, there was, we, I get a lot, and this is a good problem to have, but I get a lot of people saying to me, why can't we do this thing I want you to do? You have so much money. It's a good problem to have, so I'm not complaining, but, um, but you know, we, sp we think in years arcs, so we spread, we, we, spread over uh, a number of years uh, our thinking around the endowment um, and that helps us account for moments that it goes higher and lower. So um, we have really careful, uh, well-trained um, 
staff work, who work on that and partner with the board to make sure that the highs and lows of any particular year are less painful. Thank you. Yes, please. That's also a, uh, from the Williams record. Uh, in a recent uh, article, uh, I read, quote, Williams College is a difficult place to be a person of color. Mm. This comment troubles me. I wonder if you have any comments, any thoughts, anything the college is doing to address the DEI issues. Thanks. So maybe we can, you want to both, I'll start, and then you want to jump in. So, um, so first of all, just to repeat the question, uh, the quote comes from an article that was in the record, which is our school newspaper, um, which cites a student saying that this is a challenging place to be a student of color, and what is Williams uh, doing about this? So. The first thing I want to say about this is back to that strategic plan. There's actually a fairly uh, substantive commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility that is a pillar of that plan, along as one kind of um, strong uh, commitment of the college that winds through the whole plan, along with another one, which is on sustainability. And these are two kind of core values that we've been trying to wind through everything we do going forward. In its most visible instantiation, right now we are uh, doing a, a kind of a capital project, so a physical investment in our Davis Center, which is our multicultural center. So right now, um, so and I'll come, I'll say, more than about a building, but I just want to know the reason I'm starting with the capital project. So our multicultural center it was created to support students, faculty, and staff of color on this campus, um, and has been, I would say, probably the most um, hands-on aspect of uh, what was done to support students of color on this campus for decades. Um, it's a very well-loved space, um, but it didn't. If you think about um, capital projects as reflecting the values of an institution, um, it wasn't actually um, a very um, hospitable spot. It, it was well loved, but it didn't have the kinds of spaces and support uh, for students and faculty and staff that we needed. So we're, we're in the middle of that renovation project, and that will open a year from January. Um, and it has a tremendous amount of support from our alumni community and our board. I say that, and I started with the building project, because I just want to note that it really is a core value of this institution, as supported by those communities, uh, to create a place of belonging for anybody who comes to this campus, no matter where they came from, uh, what their background, points of view, experiences, nationality, religion. You know, we have a huge amount of diversity on this campus. And one of the things that the Davis Center does, which sits in our Office for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, is not only supports those students, but also tries to help the campus deal with creating um, conversations across difference. So, so in other words, it's not just it's not just about supporting uh, students of color, but it's about helping the whole campus be a place where diversity can thrive and conversations across difference can happen. Having said this, and it's really important to acknowledge it, and I think it's where the uh, sort of the heart of the question comes from. When you live in a diverse community. Um, Prob we can have problems, right? When students talk across difference, or anybody talks across difference, sometimes there are challenges. And what the college is trying to do is use the Davis Center's peoples and programs and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to help all members of our community do the work that we need to do in order to be prepared to foster those conversations and, and very importantly, to address problems when they emerge. Um, I think it's actually probably utopian to assume we're never going to have conflict around difference. So we want to do the best we can to educate the community to prevent that from happening. But we also want to empower the community when it does happen to have the resources they need to help navigate through those moments. Um, and, and so I would say those are both core commitments um, and they work in parallel. I'd like to someday be able to say we will never have those problems. But I want to make sure that when those kinds of issues emerge, or when a student feels that way, that they actually have resources here. And I really believe they do. Um, and if you have students that feel they don't, please come talk to us afterwards, because there are so many resources here to support students from a huge array of background uh, when they're feeling challenged in that way. Do you want to add? Yeah, I would just add that um, apart from the, the Davis Center, which is a really exciting new, new building project, 
in our um, intellectual work and in our curriculum, we emphasize diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's a requirement to graduate that you take a course that's designated as a difference, power, and equity, a course that engages these questions. Um, and Williams is more diver racially diverse and, and certainly um, income level diverse, I think, than it's ever been before. But, you know, like all of higher education, you know, Williams, or most of higher education, it, for most of its existence, it was not particularly diverse. Um, and so I, it's an exciting time to be here, but, you know, the Williams of the past is not the Williams of the present, but there's, hold on, you know, just, just like all sorts of institutions, I think, in our society that are um, in, in moments of, of exciting transformation. It's not always bump free. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please, over there. Um, just in light of the discussion you're just having, how are you thinking about potential changes that a potential Supreme Court of uh, like on diversity admissions might affect? Thank you. So the question is about the case that's in front of the Supreme Court that is uh, taking up a couple of cases that uh, have challenged the role of affirmative action in um, college and university admission processes. Um, and of course, that case is just about to be heard, um, and we won't know the results of it until probably until June. Um, so, although that's typically the way things happen uh, out of the Supreme Court. Well, there's been that even that has had some challenge of late, but let's assume we won't know the outcome until June. Um, although we have a, a sense of where this particular court might go on this issue. Um, so uh, we are preparing for a world um, in which uh, we will no longer be able to factor race in as one of the things that we consider uh, in admissions questions. Um, and uh, you know that is not something um, that we are pleased about. <laughs> but uh, and I can say, you know, and I would say very strongly that and I'm here I'm just speaking personally, and I, I should say that um, you know people feel very differently about this. I suspect there are differences of opinion in this audience, and that's, I hope those are the kinds of conversations we can foster on the campus and throughout. Speaking personally, uh, one of the things that um, affirmative action has allowed us to do is achieve some of the massively diverse uh, uh, transformations that have affected this campus. Um, and so uh, we are gonna just continue to explore if we can't use um, those methods anymore, what methods we can use for continuing to ensure that we have as diverse a population on this campus as possible. And so that's what we're going to continue to try to figure out how to do if it happens. But, you know, for now, that's not the reality. Thanks. Uh, yes, there's a question in the back. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I was wondering if, um, I know there was a session on this earlier, so I apologize if I missed it, but if you could say something equally comforting to parents of first years about summer plans and what we should or should not be trying to like converse with them about at this stage. So, okay, equally comforting? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that's okay. You tell me when I reach the level. So, yeah, they should, the, the first thing is, um, there are a number of opportunities here on campus in the summer. And that's one reason to talk to faculty. Um, sometimes faculty have opportunities um, or can steer students to opportunities in, on campus or in the area. Um, for the summer and we can help out with housing and that, that sort of things. There's the Zilka Center for Environmental uh, Studies, for example, always employs students and there are other, uh, there's some research positions. That's a, a little harder sometimes after the first year, but not, not always. So that, that's the first thing. I would also say it's a good moment to stop in at the Center for Career Exploration and speak with them um, about opportunities either where they're from or if they're, they're sometimes alumni interested in hiring students for the summer. Um, another place to look in is CLIA, which is our Center for Ex Experiential Learning, also has summer programs um, for which they hire uh, students to do all sorts of sort of community-based projects that are often really 
interesting and exciting. So that that's a few places that that they can go. And a lot of students want that first summer after their their you know their first year of college, they want to go home and see all their friends and you know, and that's fine too. Scoop ice cream or whatever, babysit or whatever, and that's that's fine too. Um, but I would say professors, ex career exploration, CLIA, Zilka, for a start. Four things. And I would just add for on the reassurance side, first year student, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, it, just to kind of take the pressure down. If they want to come home, they're homesick, and that means scooping ice cream or being a lifeguard, <laughs> or maybe not just sitting around the couch all summer, but <laughs> you know, something. Some um, they want to travel with their friends or see their high school friends. That is okay. Like, help us take the pressure off. It is okay. That thing I said about the 12 month, four year arc, that means that for the student who wants it, we're going to try to help them find um, things that expand their learning horizons any summer that they're here that they want it. But it is okay to do that at home. It is okay to do it in a low pressured way. And it is fine, um, you know, for their futures. This is the reassuring part. If, um, if they're, they're not, they don't have that, you know, high paid internship in New York City or, you know, you know, honestly, you know this, so I don't want to misrepresent. There are certain things, there are certain professions where you get going earlier and that's true. Um, but it is also equally true and far more per important to say out loud, there's not only one thing to do in the world, um, and college is about exploration. I had a student say to me the other day, um, one of my advisees, I had an existential crisis about my major, um, and, and she talked me through her existential crisis. And I said, everything was great. It was, so it involved, like she was started in one major and now she wasn't sure she wanted to major in it because there were no courses next semester that she wanted to take in that. And it was actually her second major. So, you know, so, but it was, and I said, it, like everything that you have told me up until now is great, except the word crisis. This is exactly what is supposed to be happening, right? Exploring, thinking, figuring out what you like to do. And it might not, you might not, if you go through one door, other doors close, that's okay. There are still a lot more doors out there. So the re, you know, it isn't all sealed with the one grade, with, uh, you know, uh, it is, it, it, it's a question of figuring out who you are when you're here and where you want to go next. That's really it. And each next is not next 50 years from now or 39 years from now, or frankly, even four years from now. Next, <laughs> for lunch, right? Next, what do you want to do next? And where is that going to, what door will that open? So I, that's what I'd focus and on. And I, I will just jump, you talked about the four-year arc thing, but there's also the well-being piece. Mm -hmm. And having students build up some resilience and um, confidence in themselves of seeing this is a long con, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we don't have to figure it all out right here, so. Yeah, so I know we're at time and folks have other places to go, so I wanted to uh, thank you again all for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to chat with you. I hope you have a wonderful visit, um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.